Gencon, and so I'm just so proud and grateful that you were willing to take two hours uh, to talk to you. I really appreciate it. Um, we have a lot to go over today. Uh, who here has been one of these talks before? Yay! Uh, this is my tenth one this year, uh, and so we've got quite a bit of experience with it. And one of those experiences is we want to try to keep questions to the end. Especially today, we have a lot of room to cover, a lot of things to talk about. And so I will be able to take questions at the end. I'm also happy to stay a little bit behind if somebody has some questions for me. Um, and that's how we're going to do it. So, how are we doing? Great. 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 Yay! We are doing great as well. Uh, what I'd like to do is try to do a little bit of a picture of how's FFG doing, what's happening to FFG, what are some of the things that have been important events to us. I'd like to show this graph to show you that things are great. Thank you so well. <laughs> Thank you. And so we, we are just so pleased, so privileged uh, to have such a success. Uh, and it just makes us get up every morning and want to try harder. So thank you very much for getting us there. Um, we get some options and frequent questions about what kind of products uh, do we have, how they all fit together, what's our product mix. I'd like to show this graph to, just to show you where, where the different you know, <laughs> dollars coming in from us. That's an interesting to find uh, our allocation of staff. We think that every category that we have is important. Uh, of note, maybe it's the managers category, from year to year, spurred in some part by Ashland, obviously, it's a major product for us. So that's a little bit of the, uh, of the numbers. So what are some events that have been happening? Last year in this room, I was so thrilled to announce that we had acquired uh, the Card Game DD website. I think Drew Dallas is here somewhere right here. What a great guy. He made such a fantastic website. He's still involved and he's helping us integrate this. We have 100 plus tournaments for a lot of our other games, so we're just thrilled about having it here. 
Uh, many of our international partners, many of who are in the room today, also do these nationals. So there's a national in France, national in Spain, national in Germany, uh, and a number of other territories. And uh, they actually uh, contribute part of this by, by sending some of their players over to, uh, to Roseville uh, in our new huge game center that we've created where we have the World Championships. Was anybody at the World Championship last year in this room? All right. Hopefully more will come. Uh, it, was, it was, I hope you agree, it was a superb event. But what, what we can do, we can do it so close. The amount of resources, the amount of coverage that we can actually provide having the event there is enormous. Because uh, the amount of energy that goes into these things are so. That is our tournament structure. I hope it makes sense to everyone. That's how we think about it. Um, we have a World Championship for the first time in the new Game Center. Like I just said, it was a really fantastic event. Then we have something some of you may have noticed. We have ventured into a new rules format. Many of our games, we hope, are just amazingly cool and they're really attractive, but if you're not a hardcore gamer, you may have picked up this cool thing and you may open it up and encounter a rule set that's pretty heavy. That remains one of our most <coughs> difficult challenges. We want to provide rich experiences that have narratives, tell stories, that have clever, balanced mechanics, but how to communicate that in, in a format that's a written word is much, much more difficult than you may think. Um, many people's rules rules are many different things. Somebody wants to just learn, somebody wants to some reference. Those two things are actually the polar opposite. So we went into a new format, which seems obvious in hindsight, where we actually split the rules formats. Now, most of our games, we have to ask there are two rule books. One very brief one to play, but which will get you started in the game. It will get you right to the key points of the game and get you going. Because in fact, there's a lot of rules you don't really need to learn before you've played it, you know, halfway through where you're encountering that weird situation with that odd rule and that kind of conflict. And, and uh, you don't really want to learn about that while you're trying to figure out how the game works. But you do want to figure out how to resolve that quickly later. And so there we provide the rules reference. The rules reference contains the entire rule set but since you're not trying to teach you anymore, we've now provided in a very, very terse, very, very precise way that is much more helpful to you as anyone when you're playing. So that is something we've done, and uh, we put it out for the first time with the other score game, and the response was <coughs> huge. <laughs> 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 it was huge. So we really encouraged by that, and we're really working towards improving that and making that better. That was FFG, that's some of the major things that have been going on. Uh, so what about product products? So that's really key what we do, obviously, is make great stuff, poor products that hopefully people love to play. One of the challenges that we have when I talk about product lines in FFG is obviously we are, you know, we have an embarrassment of riches. We, we have so many things that are so great and we don't have the time, I don't have the time today to talk about everyone. So for every line that I mentioned now, there will be at least one that is just as deserving to mention, but for the same reason or not, that I'm not going to mention today. So if your particular line that you're involved with is one of the ones not mentioned, I'm sorry, you love it just as much, but the other lines may have some relevance today that was just stronger than the other. So that's a pretty good one. Talk about Descent. Descent, in fact, is our number one best-selling board game month. It's significant. It is fantastic. If you have not tried it, I encourage you to try it. We have demos in the booth. We have a fantastic wealth of rich content for it. We have an online quest builder. We have these new lieutenant packs which we put out, which are really phenomenal. They allow us to provide the really high quality miniature and game content in these uh, in these packs. We have a new monster and hero packs which we did because there was so much demand for our traditional old heroes from the first edition to return to the world and the old monsters to return. So we went back and we did it in a way where you can get the most beautiful new sculpts that we knew about the conjure, and new artwork, and some new engagement with these characters and monsters. And they also have a few available at that. In addition to all that, you know, uh, Descent is a style of game we call a movie war game. Where one player plays the dungeon master or the main the evil genius mastermind trying to, to trunch the, the, the player character. Uh, and that, that is a great way to, to engage the game. And that's not for everyone. But so we said, well, maybe there's a different way to, to approach Descent. And so we put out the co-op solo expansion, which <coughs> actually provided an entirely new way to play and engage with Descent that where the Overlord is now run by these uh, neutral decks. 
And that has just blown us away. That we put that first in a game night kit, and it became one of our best selling game night kits overnight. It was huge. And so we're happy to say that we're providing more content for this. We have announced Nature's Ire as a second major adventure for this, and the response has been great. We love it. In addition to that, we're not stopping with our support for Descent Proper. Uh, our big new expansion is Manor of Ravens. Um, it's greatly available that is available at the show today. That was a brief update <coughs> on Descent. On that runner. That runner may be the, the game that we have actually have the highest player base. It is just phenomenal. I mean, it is the response that we got. We knew it was going to be a cool, hot game. We put it out two years ago. If anybody's here remembering the kind of rapid firestorm that, that happened when that game came out, it really surprised us. We had brought more games than we had ever brought before to a Gen Con, but it was, it was like water on a hot stone. It was, it was crazy. We were, it was embarrassing how few we had brought in, in hindsight, but there's very few tools that really give us information about what we really want, and so we guessed wrong in that particular instance. Um, it is our most successful card game. It is a product that we continually support and have new stuff we have for on a basis of the existing card games that we have. And so you can actually purchase these to get a really fun round experience for Netrunner. It's not something that is going to be the future of Netrunner in the sense that it's going to be where new product is going to be seen. Um, it is going to be something that we, that we consider a uh, con event or a special event, a special party event, kind of a sideshow to the main network. Mm -hmm. It's basically between the Houdini pack is out at the show. And I'm announcing today Order and Chaos. Order and Chaos. Oh, two boxes have come out already, uh, each highlighting two of the factions. This one. I like the Anarch and Wayland factions, and uh, if, uh, if rumors have it right, it is the best one yet. Uh, this box is on display you know, in about an hour on our, uh, on our booth. Check it out. Elder Sword. Wow. This game was our most successful one. Uh, it was just received wonderfully. I mean, there was that reaction to the blue booklets, but it really provided some of all the lessons we learned about these style of games. Uh, and we couldn't be more pleased with how that's come out. Uh, it's just a product to our performer. Uh, we released the Forsaken Lore expansion, which, again, something surprised us. This thing it blew up in a matter of two weeks. We had no more. We had to be printed. We have a fan base for Elder Shore that is just wonderful. And for them today, I want to announce a new product. Really excited about this product. Well, I'm not going to Take that mythos into the planet, into the globe, and explore these faraway places with <coughs> horrible ancient secrets. Uh, and this is one of them. And uh, this is such a classic, such an iconic place to go, and we're going there. And this box is just filled with goodies. It is, it is incredible. Um, it, has, it does have a sideboard, it has more characters, it has more cards, um, it has more ancient ones. It is a gigantic box. Um, one thing that somebody uh, who's played a lot of Arkham Horror will, will realize is that once you have a lot of expansions and you have all these sideboards and different things, uh, the, the work of actually starting to play a game like Arkham Horror can be difficult because you have to choose from this giant out of heart, you know, list of different expansions. We consider this pretty careful. We want to make sure that, that the organically the game had a way to mitigate that issue. So the expansions coming down, that we're working on for this horror, will provide there's a, there's a rules mechanic that provides um, which for you, basically randomly, which options, which sideboards, et cetera, will actually come out during the game. You can choose them if you like. You can dip for that deck and choose what you want to play with. But ultimately, we want you to be able to sit down, not have to worry about what you know, constellation of a game we can play today. Sit down and play the core game and organically from that game, uh, the expansions that the game wants you to play is going to actually be able to be called. And so we think that is going to be some awesome ways to experience uh, where we started with Arkham War. And uh, now we're of course moving to the next level of the Antarctic. Very excited about this. <coughs> also for display in our display case. Lord of the Rings, I lost talk about every year. Lord of the Rings is such 
uh, amazing product line for us. It is it is hugely successful, very very popular. <coughs> the fact that we're going to take a customizable car game experience and make that a solo co-op style game, and uh, it's such a loyal fan base for us, and uh, continue to develop lots of product. And that will end this game. It's just so fun. Um, it's something you can play for yourself, you can play with your wife, your friends, your brothers, and you're of course playing together, you're customizing decks. You have this experience when you're customizing deck, you always think about your adversary. So generally you customize decks by your own, you know, they, in your own mind, because you don't want anybody to really know the hell you're getting your deck. This is such a different experience, you can customize your decks together. Uh, and it's really phenomenal. Uh, we have of course added last year the separate nightmare decks. Why did we do that? Well, when you're achieving a co-op experience, we have to generate content that you want to achieve in an analog way. It's very difficult to, to, to balance something that's for a new player, an experienced player, or an extremely, extremely experienced player. You obviously want to challenge when you're going against something like AI. And so we're able to, to stratosphere and uh, take the challenge into three different levels. So it's an easy, standard, and nightmare. For the nightmare mode, you get these extra decks, you add them to whatever adventure that you're playing, and it makes it much more challenging than something that the really high and hardcore players have really appreciated. Um, there are two different styles of play for local rings. In fact, there are the, the general packs that we have, which are new adventurers, they're new discoveries in Middle Earth, and then we have what we call Saga expansions, and those we are delivering to be uh, a replica of the narrative stories that you know in those books. So the two hobby expansions would now allow us to take you through a series of six adventures, takes you through all the main narrative points of the hobby, and experience the hobbit through your deck through those. And we're of course started working on Lord of the Rings. Last year we came up with the Black Riders, which introduced basically the first half of the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, this year, available at the Supreme Con, is the second half of the Golden Darkness. And today announcing the third act in the Lord of the Rings Saga Boxes, the Treason of Solomon. Now, when you were playing Lord of the Rings Saga Boxes, obviously in the first two, you were, you were basically playing from the point of view of Ring Bear, uh, Frodo General. And um, as in the books, in the point of view, it really kind of splits, you know, the whole fellowship splits up. And so that is why when we get into this part of the saga, your focus now shifts to Aragorn. Uh, as, as your primary character. You don't want everyone to be killed because he's the king and uh, he needs to do something later. So uh, there's a switch here that's happening. It's really exciting and of course we'll come together at the end we have this master vision for how the story is going to come together and how these two arcs are going to arrive at the same point and we can't wait to share that with you uh, a year or two down the line when we're finishing up these cycles. So, do you know Saruman? You can see the box downstairs. It'll be available uh, just early next year. <coughs> two. Like I said, there were two trajectories. Uh, we have been to a couple different places in our discovery of the Rings. We've been to Gondor, we've been to Moria. Uh, lately, we were at the Isengard area. Next, we go to Angmar, the lost realm of Angmar. Here are our adventurers now. They go north, north of Rivendell. <coughs> Northeast of the Shire lies an old evil place that's awakening. This will be the progenitor of the Angmar Awakening Cycle. Uh, and we're very happy with the way that we're able to interlace narrative and discovery of Middle Earth. So Angmar is next on this play. Come on, what we're role playing. Two years ago, I heard controversial that said we're going to put out a Star Wars role playing game and we're going to put out three games. What? what does that mean, people said. Uh, and why did we do that? We, we did that because we believe that the, the emotion and the excitement that you want about Star Wars is very different from what a lot of other people want about Star Wars. In fact, we looked at message boards over and over again and said, what do we really want out of a Star Wars role playing experience? It was always like, I want to be the guy. No, 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 no. that's not Star Wars. The Han Solo storyline is Star Wars. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's the struggle, it's the military struggle between rebellion and the empire. And, oh, that's, that's the Star Wars. And it was really quite tragic. There are a lot of people approaching that Star Wars IP in different ways. So we decided to actually provide that with a full game, allowed to explore each of those classes really well, beautifully, and allowed to really engage in that side. 
However, when they were all out, you'd be able to combine them and you'd be able to put together those building blocks, the Star Wars experience you want. It takes time to make. These things are big, important books. Uh, we have not put out two of them. Age of Rebellion, Edge of the Empire, exploring, of course, the scoundability and freelancer side of the galaxy on the Outer Rim. Age of Rebellion, exploring that martial aspect, <coughs> saboteurs and rebels and secret spies and missions and superior Star Destroyers, all that good stuff. Um, we put out beginner games for Star Wars, which I am extremely proud of. Somebody here has not played a role playing game before. We got a box for 30 bucks. It has everything you need to know, and actually, it's one of the best, in my opinion. And I'm biased, uh, but has one of the best <laughs> introductions to how to do uh, experience a role playing game that, uh, that at least we can figure out how to do it. And I heard this very proud of it. We think we have a great level of support. There's a number of support books that come out for this. We do special decks that are in the factory that are basically printed on the screen. <coughs> if you want these special custom decks to help you track your character skills. Today we are talking, uh, actually announcing some new uh, new style of decks, not the same format. These are adversary decks, and they will hopefully help the GM uh, come up with random encounters or come up with ideas for cool characters and so on. They will each be six ninety five, and they each have twenty different uh, monsters or character encounters. For Star Wars RPG. You'll notice how we're starting to gravitate towards the Star Wars role playing uh, because we're going to start having assets that are going to be available for all three games, as opposed to one of the singular names. Of course, a special Gen Con event for Star Wars has been Force of Destiny. <laughs> Cycle is complete, you know. We are now exploring Force. We're now exploring Jedi. We're exploring the Sith, the mysticism of the galaxy. Uh, so this now completes that trilogy, that vision that we have for how to really, the best way possible, achieve everybody's desire out of Star Wars and they can them at the end. This is going to release in spring. You know, if you would please, uh, if you're interested in it, you can get the beta here, you can uh, start playing it. Let us know what you think. Areas you don't know like. Hey, let us know. We have a format for that. We can see if we, uh, if we agree and then we can go into the final game. But even if it's a beta, it's a fully playable, realized, play-tested game. It's ready to go. Um, available here. So, this is a controversial topic because we love Battle Lore, despite what people may think. We have this game that is fantastic. And, and we, have, we are at a lot of plans for Battle Lore and really excited about what we have going on for Battle Lore. But we have been a little slow, at least according to some, about how to support Battle Lore. That's something that we say, okay, we get that. However, there's some reasons for that. So I'm going to go on a couple of those reasons right now and show some cool stuff. First of all, we do have more stuff coming out for Battle Lore. We have something called Army Boxes. The first part of our is the Warband of Scorn. They're two army figures almost doubling the unit assortments for those armies. They're going to be 50 point armies in each box. Uh, pretty similar to the number of classic characters, and they're going to be $39.95 a piece. They'll have more lore cards, they'll have more scenario cards, they'll have more terrain, and this whole new army of all new units, which really expands the, the two existing armies, the Khan and the Pokemon. That, of course, with that, we now have two fully featured diverse armies opening the door to potentially expanding into different areas of the universe <coughs> in the future. Uh, and that we're very excited about. But also one reason that there has been a little delay in Battle Lore is because we have been interlacing it with another major project of ours that we've been developing internally that we want to show you today.
make sure that what we do for that game, which is just phenomenal, developed in-house by our very own team, we're working on it for more than a year, reconciles with the physical game has been one of the reasons that we have maybe not been as on the ball as, as, as at least for the perception has been. Battle of Command is going to come out um, probably in about two months. It's a game that has a really epic single player campaign, huge amount of content for single player. It has local multiplayer, you can customize two fully realized armies. Uh, there's a lot of new unit content, which you may of course maybe see in the future as a, as a physical component. Uh, it is for iOS Universal, it's for Android. There is Mac and PC versions coming out. It's going to be 995. We're very excited about it. Yeah.
little seven finger there. Like I said, I have a lot to go through today. Let's talk about some more stuff. We're going to some of the most important product lines that we have right now and introduce you some exciting things with product lines. Now let's talk about maybe some product lines that are not uh, pre existing, that are new and interesting to this show. For example, let's talk about Warhammer Conquest. <laughs> Two years of the we take our LCD brand extremely seriously. We believe we deliver a number of LCD games that are all big, extremely strong games. Now, they may, some people may like one style of game more than the others, but we believe that all the games are really an exception. And so, when we, another game we call an LCD, we take that challenge extremely seriously. Uh, and so, we have been working on Warhammer 40K Conquest for a very long time. We're very proud of what it looks, how it plays, and how it's going to be rolled out. Competitive LCG, it has two paths to victory, it contains bluffing, it's a now versus future resource allocation, it has seven playable factions right out of the box. There are two more to follow. Um, the content is all displayed down down the booth, you may have seen it already. It's available at the show. Just like any LCG, we're going to be supporting it with packs. It's always fun for us to try to come up with what we're going to call these packs. We have chapter packs, data packs, uh, and these are four packs. What do we have? Chapter packs, data packs. Adventure packs. <laughs> so it's like, what are we gonna do? You know, we'll this, this one was those war packs. It was actually originally warp packs, but uh, war packs is what we ended up with. So, um, so here, here uh, we have a sold-out 96-person Argo tournament, which we're calling Death, the Death Eater tournament, right? World Eater, the World Eater tournament that is happening tomorrow. Uh, I don't know if there's spots left. <laughs> Sorry, it's all sold out. Like I said, sold out. <laughs> really excited about this. This thing is shipping very soon. Uh, the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to have it all over the world. Uh, it is our next big LCG, so please uh, expect the same sort of support, organized play, organized play gets and so forth that we do with our entire line of LCGs. The, the, the demo deck's coming, so we have to be able to go to a local retailer, that, that retailer will be provided uh, with a big box of demo decks to get everybody uh, involved at least trying this product. So, Let's talk about a game that I am super excited about. XCOM. Now, who here are old time XCOM fans? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> XCOM is one of those Sid Meier games that just are amazing and we'll probably see this brand live on for decades. We are so proud to be able to provide a board game version of this. Uh, there's some really interesting elements of this which you may not have heard about. It's a collaborative game, players play together. Um, it's a focus on the global battle. And this is a, kind of a controversial decision, but I want to explain why the decision was made. Because some people may believe that, or truly believe that, they may feel that the nucleus of the XCOM experience is the um, isometric, character-based, grid movement, tactical game. Um, if you look into this, that seems the obvious choice. You do XCOM, and then you do the great base back game. But in fact, in our opinion, the right choice, the great choice is not to replicate that. Because in fact, we always do is replicate what's already on the screen. It plays a core game. It has action points, uh, it has a great movement, it's turn based. Uh, this is, plays like a fantastic core game already. <coughs> Why would we want to do something that is something that is done to the base play? Why not try to do something that's different and that really harnesses some of the positive and interesting things that we can get out of our, our, our board game? So we just have to focus on the global scale battle. Obviously, you're still gaining soldiers, training soldiers, sending two soldiers on the missions, uh, but those missions are just less narratively important to the game than the actual period game. One of the more controversial aspects <coughs> is that it absolutely requires a digital app. Now, this is some people don't necessarily like this, and I understand. But this is something really editive and cool, and it really think, pushes our ability to give you new experiences to a new place. So, I want to talk a little bit about weapon integration, because it is a hot topic right now. I'm sure it's going to be something that is not going to be. Um, Need to us, uh, obviously. Um, other companies are thinking about how to, how to utilize that thing in your pocket. <coughs> how can we do this? And how can we do this now? Well, first of all, we feel like there's a near ubiquitousness of availability of technology. I mean, how good it is not everyone has this, but a substantial portion have available 
has some technology available. There's an ease of access to content that technology can display. There's a physicality of touch screens that really added something that is that allows you to get that step closer to that data. You know, that the, the keyboard was that kind of intermediary before. But those touch screens, we're really getting close, we're really getting interesting, we're getting tactile, we're touching things. Um, it gives us some potential to add things to the box because we can take some things out. Like, we've never done a game with a sand timer, but we should have looked at it. A sand timer is expensive. A sand timer is a piece of monetary, which you're probably going to pay between three and five dollars for in the retail price. Now, if I don't want to put that sand timer in that box, I can take that three to five dollars and make other cool stuff and put it in that box for you. Um, and so, we can potentially harness this vehicle that almost everyone carries and add more value. We can use the built-in sensor occupation that comes for free. You mean have a device, you can play music, you can move the edges. There are other games that I've used before, like VHS tapes or DVDs or CDs. Well, in these cases, you also need a secondary kind of mechanism. In this case, you have a mechanism that gives you all this logic, but it also gives you these sensory aspects for free. Um, it gives us, most importantly, an ability to make something we could never make before. Stuff we want to do with digital integration, what we've done with Exxon, we could not make. We could not do it. Not sensibly. Uh, in, in a world now. And last, we talked about this a little bit vis a vis our rules. Rules are difficult. And we want a lot of people to play our games because they are great. Our experiences that we have in our industry, experiences that I hope you all love, experiences of why there's so many people at Gen Con, because we have great experiences. But one of the great barriers to having more people in those experiences is complexity, the barrier of entry to play, the rule book that's the, the complexity and so on. We're able to do with this device, you'll see that the, the rule book for XCOM is four pages long. It basically is a nice cover, a page that says hello, we love you, and then a setup sheet, and then it says after you're done setting up, hit play, and hit the tutorial. And it'll take you to a scripted step-by-step -step version to play the game. Okay? Um, that's a great way to learn how to play. After about two whole phases of scripted walkthrough, it will ask you, hey, do you want to keep playing? Right now, we can just release you into the actual game where you can stop and start over. Now, so that's great. I mean, obviously, if you have a question about some card deck or something, you may not want to look to go forward again. So that's why we provide a completely documented uh, uh, info part of the game. We can go and look at the various rules of the game if you should choose. Now, obviously, for that, we can update that. If you want to create new rules, if you want to propose a rule that's not really explainable enough, you can update the software. We can't send you a new rule. Um, so these are all really important reasons to do this. So what are some of the pitfalls? The way I see visual integration is a little bit like this. There's a degree of integration. How much am I integrating my, my device into the game? And how much is it really relevant to what I'm trying to experience? And I was in the bell curve happening here, actually. If I am integrating very, very little, I think I probably have a gimmick. Because I don't really need it. I have something that's, man, that's kind of fun. The first time I played it, we hit the button and we had a fart sound and it was cool. <laughs> then it got boring and we got rid of that. If you do the other way around, well, why do I have all these annoying cards and why do I have these chips? Why do I have these things? I mean, that's not cool. You know? I want that all of me to have this book. So that leaves us with this area that I call the discovery zone. It's a new place in the world where we can try to have a degree of integration, digital integration that's balanced and produce something new and that avoids those two traps of being a gimmick or just being all out software. So that's how we think about it. A few other points of how we think about how to work on this. We think that digital integration is not the same as a digital tool set. A digital tool set is something that we do. A digital tool set is something you can buy to be a dice roller a way to track your, your fleets or your bills. It's something that you can use that helps you uh, format the experience to your liking, or at least your experience. But it's not something you need to play the game. Digital integration to us is something you need to play the game. And like I said before, this is something that we kept coming back to XCOM, is to say that we have to be brave, I think. We have to say, if you come back to me with a design that says, hey, here's a cool thing we can do, but we could also replicate that with cars. I would push that back so you're not using that medium well enough. There's a lot of stuff that this digital device can do, which we could never do with cars. So if this could be replicated, 
feasible to replicate. Well, again, the, the number of millions of card decks that we wanted to. But if it could replicate feasibly, um, then we, I don't think we pushed ourselves enough to really take advantage of this great new format. And so, unfortunately, for the people who hope that there's some deck that's going to come out that will, that will uh, reverse engineer and be able to get rid of the digital device, this can't happen. So we can't do the things that the app does using physical components. That was important to us. It's important to us when we do digital integration that we do it because it really makes sense. Not because we can't. We don't want to just flap this all over the place because it's sexy and different. So that's not going to happen. We still have there's lots of amazing names that have no digital augmentation. We don't need to do it. It's only when it's really great. To us, we are a toy, board game, hobby game manufacturer. We're now a software publisher. So in the end, this digital integration is serving the physical products. We're a physical products company. And we use this as a tool to make the enjoyment of those physical products better, not to provide you the software game. To so understand the game state, this is a really technical thing. Uh, when you have an app or a device that's trying to understand what's going on in your board game, that can be a tricky situation because you really want it to understand as much as possible what's going on in your game for it to give you, for it to give you clever feedback, clever decisions. Uh, and so it's very important that when it, this thing is designed, that it's done so with minimal user input. So what you do not want to have happen, for example, is an app that at every turn says, all right, stop. Please tell me how many cards these players have. Please tell me any of these stores. Please tell me where these units are, all this kind of stuff. And you're spending an eternity, you know, inputting all this data into this app so we can give you some result. That has to be absolute minimum. There may be technology in the future, near field technology, all this kind of stuff that may be able to recognize game states uh, better. Uh, but there's also a way to think to only use digital integration when you can create an experience that does not have a significant amount of, of, uh, of reverse input. And then, of course, it has to add value to the player to the customer. Sometimes, you know, a publisher, you know, we've been guilty of this, we've been caught of doing something because it's cool, and it ends up not really adding a lot of value. So we are trying to be very careful about you know, that, that point. So that is digital integration. Um, there's been some, some, I think, fair comments. You know, I think one comment is, like, what happens 20 years from now when I pull out my game from the shelf and I want to play it with my grandkids or something? You know? I can't do it now because where is the software at? Well, first of all, I really love the fact you want to play this game 20 years from now. I think that's great. Uh, secondly, um, we are making this game, this software, available on Windows, on Mac, on Android, on iOS. These are four of the most ubiquitous software platforms in the history of mankind. Uh, even now, when we look back at older versions of software, our, our, our capabilities of, of replicating that in those experiences. I would like to believe that the, the ubiquitousness of which we're allowing the software to be available for free, uh, that it should be playable 20 years from now. I can't promise that, but I have no idea what will happen 20 years from now. Um, but if there's a great concern and it's, and it's that level of, of generality does not swing you from being a, a problem for you, then I would encourage you to look at these kind of games like they were technology purchase as opposed to a regular physical purchase. They're, they have technologies that have all the upsides and the potential downsides of them. You're aware of these facts. We think the economy experience you can provide is worth that downside. <coughs> okay. So, XCOM is available late this year. Give me 60 bucks. And uh, play it if you want to play it. Thank you. Please come out and play. There are eight seats. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. It's pretty hard to get a demo, but especially if you're about early in the morning, I think you can get a seat. So, that's XCOM. Let's talk about our mod about some of the things we've added to, to this game. Obviously, it is a representation. Is there really a lot of guys in there? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go pick the book. Whoa!
predictions. Uh, we have now, there are very few of the mechanics or aspects of x wing which we now uh, try to replicate. We want to have a more considered, a more deep, longer play experience that really felt like I was, I was controlling Star Destroyers. I was navigating the strategy for a big fleet. I was seeing fighters in the round, I was having you know, big capital ships burning, I was dealing with crew. Uh, all those things is what we wanted to add in this, in this game. We also wanted to try to add some of the experiences and some of the resources that we have vis-a-vis -vis our plastics technology and our plastics development to try to do some really innovative things which allows you to track uh, some aspects of the game, uh, use innovative movement, um, and do a variety of things using plastic mechanics that actually take miniatures games a way to interface with physical forms in a new direction. There are some really cool things with the movement on, there's some really cool things with the fighter stands. It's uh, hard for you to explain. You have to find a <coughs> feel. Go down and check them out on the, on the floor to see what kind of cool stuff we've added to the game. Um, it's available in early 15. It's a huge box. It's a ton of stuff in this game. It's going to be a $100 retail. It's demos in the booth. And, uh, but when <laughs> you buy that core set and you've got like that cool Victor Class Star Destroyer and you've got an Emblem Game Free and a Tan and Four. You may be thinking, I would like some more variety of stuff to play with. So, where's that? Well, it's here. The first wave of products, which released over about a, probably a two month period, uh, early next year, is going to be the core set. We are going to sell the Volcano Runner, the Nebulon B, and the Victory Class separately because people may want to build a code fleet to contain more than one copy of these. And we don't necessarily want you guys to have to rebuy the core set over again. So this allows you to buy these. It also give you more new different kind of pilots, different equipment, different crew, captains, strategies, and so on to use these packs. But there needed to be a little more variety out the gate, which is why we're thrilled that the Assault Free and Mark Free would be a little bit more of a beefy, chunky guy that will work for the Rebellion. We're excited that the Empire gets a Gladiator class Star Spurs to be a little more nimble. Uh, in the game, we get some bunch of TIE Fighters and x wings we all know there's a pretty significant variety of fighters and ships that you can have in this game. So that's why the Rebel Fighter Pack will contain eight squadrons of A-Wings, B-Wings, X-Wings, and Y-Wings. And the Imperial Fighter Pack will, of course, contain a similar assortment of TIE Fighters, TIE Advanced, TIE Interceptors, and TIE Bombers. And that, then, is the entire rollout of Armada, and you've heard half of it here first. All the stuff is ready, it's gorgeous, you see it today. Um, Why do you hate our paychecks? <laughs> <laughs> you loved it, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will, I'll move on. Uh, <laughs> we, have, we have so much to cover, right? So much to cover. That's a great topic, but we'll talk about this. <laughs> Adventure adventure games. So we are a company that has been known to do adventure games. We love adventure games, and we got the chance to interface with CD Projekt Red in Poland, and they have this really great game that came out by Nazi Twebczyk. Yeah. Uh, we said, let's do it, because it is gorgeous, it was great. We were able to work with, with the Nazi on creating a really special, style adventure game that mixes the exploration and content with resource management. Um, Nancy, of course, a top designer, uh, great guy, really happy to work with him. Um, it's a hybrid resource gathering, exploration, it's a relatively fast game. And uh, some people have asked us whether this is our new Runebound. No, it's not a new Runebound. This is a stepper project that we're working on with, with CD Project Red. One of the cool, cool aspects of the game is it has four unique characters in the game. Each character has their own specific deck of cards, and they really play substantially different. Uh, so if you want to interface with this game, not only because of the variety of cards, these character play is <coughs> the game, but it's also a different character really feels a different experience in interfacing with the world. It's available late this year. 60 bucks. Play it with Let's dive into that dark earth, into that dark, dark space of the Warhammer 40k universe once more. We have been really privileged to publish the 40k uh, RPG line for the last eight years, seven years of that. Um, and we learned a lot of stuff from, from, from publishing those books. 
to buy, we have the last two years been working on creating a really, really centered, uh, crafted edition of the Dark Heresy War Game. Um, this game specifically tries to balance the notion of being the Inquisitor with all the you know the former 40k universes are really powerful individuals and order the destruction of the worlds uh, with uh, the acolytes and the investigators that have worked for that Inquisitor. And somehow balance the experiences that, that people want out of that, that, uh, that type of game. And that was the problem with the first edition, was that there was a significant power balance issue between these acolytes and the Inquisitors that you could play, and uh, this really seeks to balance that. <coughs> There's an unbelievable amount of artwork in this game and craft. Um, every single spread has some new art, or some new craft, that, that some new graphic design element that was either drawn or, or made uh, by our own graphic designers. They've been working on it for over a year. It is far, far not the most detailed, expensive book we have ever made. It is gorgeous. If you're at all into one of 40K, I recommend going and checking it out. It's in the booth, the disc sale is there now. We also have a GM screen shipping with it, and we're announcing now that God and Goddess, which is the first adventure module, is going to be out this fall. I'm very excited about relaunching the Dark Series Line. It's great. Check it out. So, this brings us almost to the end of my review of a bunch of exciting and Gen Con. Almost to the end. We're not quite done. Let's return to the stars. Let's talk about a game I call Imperial Assault. Imperial Assault is a miniatures board game for Star Wars. Imperial Ooh. Assault is a game that where we have taken. <laughs> character-driven board game experience with a huge amount of content. <coughs> this, well, this game is huge. It is fantastic. It creates one of 30 miniatures and 13 unique sculpts. There are two games in this box. People have asked, why don't you make a miniatures game for Star Wars? We wanted to make a miniatures game that was kind of ours, so we provide you now with a game that is a huge, amazing adventure Star Wars board game and a competitive, two-player, customizable squad head -to -head experience that is going to receive all of the organized play, all the excitement that all of our organized play nice. capable games get. This has been the most ambitious project I have ever undertaken. And I've undertaken some pretty big ones. This is an unbelievable value. <coughs> it's available early next year. It's going to be 100 bucks. It's going to be demos in the booth. Starting right now. Oh. Yes. Oh. 